Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Pums Coordinator. Thank you all for being here. And please turn off your cell phones. This is the first time I'm actually making that announcement. Seven years, right? The cell phone has grown, so please turn it off. Um, we'd also like to thank the University Library for hosting this event here and the lovely Morrison Library. Uh, I invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk. Um, we send out uh, an email every month to remind you of our upcoming programming. Also on our website, lunchpums.berkeley.edu, you can view this reading and all of our past readings on YouTube where we have our very own channel. It's really cool. Uh, next month, uh, December on December 7th, please join us for a reading by uh, Pulitzer Prize winner and former U.S. Poet Laureate Rita Dove. She will be welcomed to campus by the current uh, chancellor, so please do come back and join us. And now welcome uh, Director of Lunch Poems, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce today's esteemed guest. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, yeah, we're very happy to have Salmaz here, um, Berkeley alum, 06, um, and to hear her read, hopefully, from some new work as well as from her debut volume, which came out last year, Look, um, and was long listed for the National Book Award, among many other moments of reception. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of how that book is structured and what it contains. Um, and I would start by saying that like poetry, the military won't leave language alone. I happen to have known for a long time, I forget why, that in the army, pens aren't called pens, they're called ink sticks. Um, and that kind of proprietary um, language, that redescription of the world has several effects. It, it inducts its users into a private community, which can have non-salutary effects when they think of themselves over and apart from other communities. And as I just already mentioned, it redescribes the world. And sometimes it's as comic as ink stick or as plain spoken. And sometimes it's death dealingly euphemistic um, or euphemistically death dealing, I could say as easily. Um, and this book has many such terms borrowed from the um, D Defense Department's Dictionary of Military Terms. Um, those terms will show up in the poems in small caps and they've been both liberated and tied to their source in that dictionary in that they're recontextualized and used in other senses, but they also retain that deep sense, both typographically and um, semiotically, of their use in a, a kind of ongoing war project. Um, so we could think of those moments as moments where that which has been appropriated into military euphemism, into an imperial project, gets reappropriated back into poetry. I think for this really intelligent poet, that's not a simple victory, so much as it's just a site of resistance and a suggestion that these, this language doesn't go to die in that place of euphemism and glossary. Um, one of the amazing things that happens when these words come back into poetry is that we hear the poetry of those awful terms even. For instance, there's a term in the book, permanent echo, which means something like a stable target, call it like a building, a mosque, something like that for bombs. And yet permanent echo also sounds like such a great figure for what's available in a poem, right? A sound that's revisitable, that's repeatable, and that has many other sort of attenuations and richnesses around the original moment of its being pronounced or looked at. So to end by speaking about the name of the book, Look, You'd think it's a command to read <laughs> or a command to regard the world, but it happens to be yet another of these military terms. Um, look means the period of time in which a mind circuit is receptive of influence, um, which you can translate into a mind being ready to go off if an unfortunate person, the influence, steps on it. So in the very command that this book constantly makes to pay attention to its language, it is already citing um, one of these awful moments of innocent redescription by the military. Um, that's the kind of intelligence at work in this book. That's its decision never to sacrifice poetry 
to a simple contention with everything outside poetry, which is also to say that I've said nothing about everything else that's happening in the book at the level of craft and form. There are sonnets, there are, there are poems written in intense syllabics, a la Marianne Moore, but that I'm going to leave you to hear as Solmaz delivers it to us. So welcome, Solmaz. Hi, Berkeley. <laughs> It's so good to be here. This is a, a dream reading series. Thank you so much to Giovanni and to Jeffrey. Um, I have been coming to these readings for many years and have wanted to give one here. It was an aspirational thing, and I'm kind of stunned to find myself here. Um, I think I'll just start by reading the title poem, Look. Look. It matters what you call a thing. Exquisite, a lover called me, exquisite. Whereas, well, if I were from your culture living in this country, said the man outside the 2004 Republican National Convention, I would put up with that for this country. Whereas I felt the need to clarify, you would put up with torture, you mean, and he proclaimed, yes. Whereas what is your life? Whereas years after they looked down from their jets, and declare my mother's Abadan block probably destroyed. We walked by the villas, the faces of buildings torn off into dioramas, and recorded it on a handheld camcorder, whereas it could take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger pulled in Las Vegas and the Hellfire missile landing in Mazar -e Sharif, after which they will ask, did we hit a child? No, a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas the federal judge at the sentencing hearing said, I want to make sure I pronounce the defendant's name correctly. Whereas this lover would pronounce my name and call me exquisite and lay the floor lamp across the floor, softening even the light. Whereas the lover made my heat rise, rise so that if heat sensors were trained on me, they could read my thermal shadow through the roof and through the wardrobe. Whereas it's not like seeing a dead body walking to the grocery store here. It's not like that. It's a rock, you know, it's a rock. It's kind of like acceptable to see that there and not. It was kind of like seeing a dead dog or a dead cat lying. Whereas I thought if he would look at my exquisite face or my father's, he would reconsider. Whereas, you mean I should be disappeared because of my family name? And he answered, yes, that's exactly what I mean, adding that his wife helped draft the Patriot Act. Whereas the federal judge wanted to be sure he was pronouncing the defendant's name correctly and said he had read all the exhibits which included the letter I wrote to cast the defendant in a loving light. Whereas today we celebrate things like his transfer to a detention center closer to home. Whereas his son has moved across the country. Whereas I made nothing happen. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life. It is even a thermal shadow. It appears so little and then vanishes from the screen Whereas I cannot control my own heat, and it can take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger, the hellfire missile, and a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas a dog, they will say. Now, therefore, let it matter what we call a thing. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. Reaching Guantanamo. Dear Salim, love, are you well? Do they, you? I worry so much. Lately, my hair, even my skin, the doctors tell me it's, I believe them, it shouldn't. Please don't worry. In the yard, and moths have gotten to your mother's. Remember? I have enclosed some, made this batch just for you. Please eat well. Why did you, me too, remarry? I told, and he couldn't, it, I would never love. I'm singing that you loved. Remember the line that went, I'm holding the, just for you, yours. There's a, a long poem in here um, that's called Personal Effects, and it's an elegy that I wrote for an uncle that was killed in the Iran-Iraq War. 
and he was a draftee whom I never met. Um, but he had on his body a thin photo album, and he also had sent some letters from the front lines. And so I tried with just that, those slim volumes to kind of piece together his life and to write him a long elegy. And so maybe I'll just read a few uh, pieces from that. Personal effects. Daily I sit with the language they've made of our language to neutralize the capability of low dollar value items like you. You are what is referred to as a casualty, unclear whether from a catalytic or frontal attack, unclear the final time you were addressed, thou beloved, it was for us a catastrophic event, just destroyed, died of wounds received in action. Yes, there was early warning. You said you were especially scared of mortar rounds. In execution planning, they weighed the losses, the sustainability, and budgeted for X number. They budgeted for the phone call to your mother and weighed that against the amount saved in rations and your taste for cigarettes and the tea you poured your boys and the tea you would have poured me approaching, hello, the change you collected in jars, jumping a bit as the family learns to slam the home's various doors. How could she say the thing she does not know? A poison-tipped arrow, she told classmates at recess to the neck, hollow whistle of it launched from a blowgun cutting the air between them. According to most definitions, I have never been at war. According to mine, most of my life spent there. Anthrax and salt and pepper shakers, patrol car windshields with crosshairs painted over them, some badge holding my father's pocket contents up to him and asking where the cash is from. The war in Iraq, I read, is over now, the last wheels gathering into themselves as they lift off the sad tarmac. I say, begin, I say, end, and you are to believe this is what happens. I say, chew 40 times before swallowing slime, and you go home to mother, press a dog tag to your temple, press a gun to that, the tag flowering into your skull. Thank God for all weather floor mats and the slope of my personal driveway and beer cans that change color to let me know they are cold enough, the full-size cab smelling of iron and axe body spray. In 2003, a man held a fistful of blood and brains to a PBS camera and yelled, is this the freedom they want for us? It was from his friend's head. They were marching as they figured Americans do, between them hardly three horsepower and still we shot him. We say the war is over, but still the woman leans across the passenger seat. My son, my son, I wasn't there, so I can't know, can I? He was, we hope, moved. Moved, but we have to guess by what. Shampoo in her wet hair, salty and fried breads, the chase scene and bullet, Sangak fresh from the oven dampening the newspaper on the walk home from the baker's, the arms of someone who smells nice to him in the morning, the mouth of someone laced with cardamom, who dances in the kitchen and lets whatever's on the stove burn, who burns for him, and beside him they burned, they boiled, they fell, shortly after a loud sound that makes him piss himself. Being nice to others, loose change, chess, he could beat all the brothers in chess. He was moved like that across a minefield, moved by a hand we cannot see, a hand that is all our hands combined. Um, maybe, I'll read, maybe I'll read the poem in syllabics. It's called Stateless Person. Um, it used to be called Exile Elegy, and it's an elegy I wrote for a grandmother. And it's kind of a transitional poem into the newer work that I've been working on. Um, so I'll read a new poem afterwards. Stateless Person. Our phone would rarely ring. I have no ear for the music here. They would bury one, then another, the eldest son dropping in the grave to comfort the corpse, calling us months later because we were exiles, were vagabonds, fugitives, past Sierras, past oil rigs in Texas, or waiting for the windshield to clear a frost, two expanding ovals where the Buick's heat hit our eyes, opened to kudzu here where the dead cannot reach us. Three thimbles with her sweat, 
In the dresser drawer they emptied wood, I bet. Roll, clink, tongueless, gauze of soot, of skin sifted off her where she scratched her head, licked her thumb to lift page after thin onion skin page cloaks her mantle. Portrait of Imam Ali, dead husband, dead son. She stuffed plastic bags into plastic bags, clouds of them, some stuffed with cash. She who pled eat, pled pray, said I pray for your soul, fasted, said ask him, never once talked of love or fondly, my husband, still, would that I could lick the dust that like, I think it's music will not reach us here, just wet my fingertip, run along inside one sock drawer so that her sugar, Shira's bits she tracked inside, I could eat, lick off her plastic tabletop, whatever fell grain by grain off her tiny tin teaspoon, where her gold went, who gives a shit? I claimed her sugar bowl, white floral veil she prayed in, to take once her daily, daily things, morning, one even, to step up her thinly carpeted steps, hear her dentures click and clap, I can't hear that music here. So as, as um, Jeffrey mentioned, throughout the book look, I use terms in small caps. Um, and in part, they're there in small caps as a kind of interruptive force to, to destroy what otherwise might be a, a, a kind of normalcy. Um, and so I always think of form in general as power enacted. And I'm trying to find various formal containers that can show to the, the various powers at play in my life and the limitations that are placed on my life and on my voice um, by those powers. And in Look, it was, you know, it was the DOD, so the DOD can kind of expand outward, but now I'm playing around more in, in syllabics and, and, and in this case, uh, anaphora in the infinitive and trying to find ways that will uh, keep me from saying what I really need to say, which is how it is to live in, in the US. Um, and so the title of the poem is The Master's House. And it's the working title of the next book, but it's not gonna be the title poem of the book, if that makes sense. <laughs> The master's house. To wave from the porch, to start again, to disrobe, to recall Ethel Rosenberg's green polka dotted dress, to call your father and say, I'd forgotten how nice everyone in these red states can be, to hear him say, yes, as long as you don't move in next door. To recall every drawn curtain in the apartments you have lived. To find yourself at 33 at a vast expanse with nary a papyrus of guidance, with nary a voice, a muse, a model. To finally admit out loud then, I want to go home. To have a dinner party of intellectuals with a bell, long-armed, lightly tongued at each setting. To sport your done gown, to revel in face serums, to be a well-calibrated burn victim, to fight the signs of aging, to assure financial health. To be lavender sachets and cedar lining and all the ways the rich hide their rot. To eye the master's bone china, to pour diuretic in his coffee and think this erosive to the state. To disrobe when the agent asks you to to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall as the lead vested agent names article by article what to remove, to do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, to say this is my film dumb, the master's house, and I gaze upon it and it is good, to make do, to make friends and influence people, to date briefly a banker, elapsed Marxist, and hear him on the phone speaking in billions of dollars, its residue over the clear bulbs of his eyes as he turns to look upon your nudity, to, to fantasize publishing a poem in the New Yorker, eviscerating his little need, to set a bell at each intellectual's table setting, ringing idea after idea, and be the simple-footed help rushing to say yes, to disrobe when the agent asks you to, to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall, to say, this is my filmdom and it is good, to recall the settler who from behind his mobile phone said, I'm filming you for God, to recall this sad God, God of the mobile phone camera, 
god of the small black globe and pixelated eye above the blackjack table at Harrah's and the metal tooth pit at Columbia checkpoint the same. To recall the Texan that held the shotgun to your father's chest, sending him falling backward, pleading, and the words come to him in Farsi. To be jealous of this, your father's most desperate language. To lament the fact of your lamentations in English, English being your first defeat. To finally admit out loud, then, I want to go home. To stand outside your grandmother's house. To know, for example, in Farsi, the present perfect is called the relational past, and used at times to describe a historic event whose effect is still relevant today, transcending the past. To say, for example, Shah Dictator Boudet Ast translates to the Shah was a dictator, but more literally, the Shah is was a dictator. To have a tense of is was, the residue of it over the clear bulb of your eyes. To walk cemetery after cemetery in these states and narrate a gravestone reading sonmas, to know no nation will be home until one does. To do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, though you've forgotten what it was. I'll close with this poem. It's called Desired Appreciation. And it opens uh, with a quote from a translation of Ovid's Ibis poem, which is a curse poem that he wrote while he was in exile. Until now, now that I've reached my 30s, all my muses' poetry has been harmless, American and diplomatic. A learned helplessness is what psychologists call it, my docile desired state. I've been largely well-behaved and gracious. I've learned the doctors learned of learned helplessness by shocking dogs. Eventually, we things give up. Am I grateful to be here? Someone eventually asks if I love this country. In between the helplessness, the agents, the nation must administer a bit of hope, must meet basic dietary needs, ensure by tube, by nose, by throat, by other orifice, must fist bump a janitor, must muss up some kid's hair and let him loose around the Oval Office, click, click, could be cameras, or the teeth of handcuffs closing to fix the arms overhead. There must be a doctor on hand to ensure the shoulders do not dislocate, and there must be Prince's Raspberry Beret. Click, click, could be Morse code, tapped out against a coffin wall to the neighboring coffin. Outside my window, the snow lights cobalt for a bit at dusk, and I'm surprised every second of it. I had never seen the country like this. Somehow, I can't say yes. This is a beautiful country. I have not cast my eyes over it before that is in this direction. Is how John Brown put it when he looked out from the scaffold. I feel like I must muzzle myself, I told my psychiatrist. So you feel dangerous, she said. Yes. So you feel like a threat? Yes. Why was I so surprised to hear it? Thank you so much. Everyone.